of the first and the foremost position of authority in our lives. In other words, love must always be our focus. We must always be focusing on love, no matter what happens. We must focus on love. And every decision you must you make is by the law of love. Everything we do is through love. And God wants us to focus on love and make love our goal. Love is our goal. And that's what we our focus is uh, today. So we must at all times give love preeminence, no matter what comes your way. Just say, is this the love of God? Every decision you make, is this the love of God? But we need to know what the love of God is. So we'll look at that today and say, well, what is the biblical definement, definition of God's love? As opposed to love is not spelled S-O-F-T, soft in the head. You know what I mean? Some people, like, they think it's like Father Christmas. You know what I mean? They, they, they've got images of what God's love. If God loved the world, he wouldn't put people. I've heard people say, if God loves people, he wouldn't put them in hell. If God loves, he wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do this. So basically, based on their definition of love, they will then project that onto God and say, okay, God, um, if he's a God of love, he won't do this. He won't do this. And he won't send people to hell because God is a God of love. So we must choose love over everything else, moment by moment, day by day, year by year. We need to choose love because it's the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord and to love each other and to love our neighbor. And even love your enemy, your enemy, the one that's going to steal from you, the one that's going to try and abuse you, the one that's going to attack you. God says, I want you to love them. Okay. So love is a choice that we have to make every single day. We have to choose every single day. Today, I decide to love. Love is not just a feeling. It's an act of your will. You've heard that said, said before, haven't you? But love is a, is a feeling. And it is an act of your will. It's not either or, it's both. So you need to feel the love of God, experience the love of God, and decide to love even when you don't feel the love because the feelings will follow the decision. You can't wait and say, you know, I don't feel any love for you today. Therefore, that's it. I don't love you. Imagine doing that with a children. I don't feel any love for you. I'm not going to give you breakfast or I'm not going to buy you clothes. It's like love is not just a feeling. But it's also a feeling because could you imagine you tell your, your wife or your husband, you know, I love you, but you know, I don't feel anything for you. <laughs> How's that going to go down? If you say, I have no feelings for you. Imagine you, got, you stand before God says, you know what? I love you, but I don't feel anything for you. God is not a robot. Okay. God has emotions. He created you with emotions. And so love needs to fill your emotions in replace and to replace anger and frustration all right, and bitterness, all that, those are emotions. And he wants you to be filled with love so that when we see our enemies, we will actually feel God's love for them. Now, that's a miracle. Because that's, that's a supernatural love that God wants to put into our hearts for our enemies. And then, um, then the reminder is love. We've got to remember this. Love always wins. No matter what decision you make, if you decide to love, and God's love. I'm not, I'm not talking about some fluffy thing. Uh, we look at what love is. If you decide to love, you'll always win. Because love never fails. Could you imagine that? You will never fail a test if you love. So you, you've, got the, you've got the open book test. God says every test you write, just, just learn to love. So every test you go through is to test whether you're walking in love. Every test. Every test you write. There's love ingrained inside. He says, I'm looking. He sees love. He's looking in love. So you got the, you had your uh, Pastor Kish at the, at, the, at the TV stolen test. And right at the end of the test, you had the decision whether I'm going to let this guy off or, or I'm going to carry on. But the guy had already repented. And God says, well, do you forgive him? You could have said no. They would have locked him up. Messed up his whole future. Got a record. A very serious implication for him. Because it's, he was there in the in the jail, yeah. and you could say, "No, I forgive him, like God forgave me." So, um, but I believe that opens an effective door for you in the in in your ministry, the new ministry now to the police. Amen. You have a new ministry to the police, and by the way, I've also got one. It looks like the police is open. It's open. It's open. Yeah, it's an effective door has been opened. 
in the police. Uh, we no longer calling it it's, uh, the police force. It's the peace force. Amen. Hallelujah. And the Amen. praying peace force. Amen. Uh, you know, it's the praying peace force. And that's a prophetic word the Lord gave us for, our, for the police in South Africa. Amen. So um, this is what God is releasing. He's doing something new. Remember he said he's doing something new? In the last couple of weeks, he says, new, forget the past. Mm -hmm. And the new thing he's doing is he's actually moving one of the new things, not just one. He's doing many new he things. Do he's doing things. lots of new things. He's going to work with the police, like in miracle signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. Not just the issue with corruption. And he's going to work in the courts as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's going to work in the justices. And he's going to, he's raising up his people to stand up in these different places with signs, wonders, and miracles mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. All right, so, and it's those people that are actually for peace. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. All right, he said, blessed, you know, that's part of the constitution. When I mean, you see all those, you know, the Beatitudes, and you go and look at it, it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons. All right, you're, a, you're sons of God. You're a son of God if you're a peacemaker. Amen. So God wants us to make peace, and God wants the police to make peace Amen. in the communities. So that the courts are never, not even needed. You don't need a court if there's peace. What's the court for? It's just when there's no peace. Yeah. So that you have law enforcement. Now you don't have, it's not law enforcement, it's peace enforcement. Can you imagine that? They get anointed with the spirit of peace upon them. And so when, now I start prophesying now with the police. So if you know someone in the police force, this is a word for the law. This is a word for them. But I'm going to, we're going to release the full word soon. Now God's sending us to the police. But it's like, can you imagine, you go in, you know, the law kills, right? The Bible says the law kills. All right, so basically what happens? If the law kills, now you law enforcement, what happens? People get killed in the line of duty. Now, can you imagine, he says, now I've given you a new law. It's the law of love and the law of peace. You go with love and peace and you are, and, and, and these people will start repenting on the streets. Darkness will be turned back. They'll start repenting and making up and, 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 and I'm not saying they won't arrest people. People will still be arrested. But at the end of the day, there are many violent situations of family fights, violent situations that can be turned peaceful because if you have a peace officer, a peace officer walks in there, boom, the anointing comes on and, 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 that, and that whole situation goes from anger, to, from anger and violence into a place of repentance and reconciliation. That's the power they have. You know, it's like, a, you know, it's like a, a doctors and nurses. You come into the hospital, you're expecting some kind of healing. You don't expect a, a slap or, or someone to take a knife and scalpel and start cutting you. Mm. You're expecting some help. Mm. But can you imagine God starts to, and that's what he's going to do. He's anointing the police officers to go out there with peace as peace officers mm. and love officers and revival officers mm. and miracle officers. Mm. And so they're going to go out there and heal the sick. Could you imagine that they go to a, a, a crime scene or someone who's had an accident, the police are there, normally the first, the police are there. Imagine there's someone there lying there dead and they go and raise them from the dead. Mm. What happened here? Yeah. The police are raising the dead. Yeah. Boom. What, what do you mean? It wasn't the pastor. No, it wasn't the pastor. He's just a police, he's a constable. Hallelujah. So we're going to see that in the most unexpected ways. God's going to raise the dead. He's going to bring peace all over South Africa because God's anointing his people, whether they're policemen, whether they're doctors or lawyers, nurses, wherever they are, judges, God's anointing his people to stand up and release his kingdom. And what is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and so, so can you imagine a, a police Officer going around and they are releasing the kingdom. Hallelujah. And you, we are called to re release the kingdom of, of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven crushes the kingdom of darkness. Now, listen, if the kingdom of darkness is crushed in South Africa, mm. there is no lawlessness. It's destroyed. Yeah. Who's behind all the lawlessness? The darkness. Yeah. So you come with the kingdom of God, crush the darkness. All the witchcraft is broken. The curses are broken. People are healed. Families are restored, and who who do we have to thank? We have we thank the 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 praying peace force because they came in with the power of God. So God is not just it's not just about uh, let's pray for peace for the city. No, God wants to equip. This is where you come in. Equip the saints. In this case, the police saints for the work of what the ministry. Amen. Yes, they must God minister. Amen. They must preach. They must cast out demons and heal the sick and baptize people. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Have you ever seen that happen? Yes. 
Mm-hmm. All right. He says they are supposed to, not the pastor. Mm-hmm. The problem is the pastor has been doing all the work. And now the, the workers are sitting there waiting for the pastor to actually do everything in the factory. Mm-hmm. He says, now, what are you doing here? Everyone must be trained out of cast out demons. Yeah. Everyone must heal the sick. Everyone must raise the dead. Everyone must preach. And everyone must have, uh, make disciples. Everyone. It's like this whole thing with the pyramid scheme now. Every pastor, pastor, pastor. I say, no, please. Listen, everyone must do every, everything that Jesus did. Everyone must do what Jesus did. So he says, make disciples, not converts. So we need to, we need to disciple the police. And they, they need to make disciples in the streets. Yes. They go there, cast out demons right there. Can you imagine you got a violence that they walk in the buck? You say, before we go in here, let's find those demons. Very da- da- dangerous for policemen to walk into, into a house or anywhere. First bind the demons. Yeah. All right, then you get all of the people. All right, get on your knees and repent. Repent. Well. Yeah, now they start repenting. And we will see miracles. And then people have been hurt. Lay hands on them there. Before the medics get there, the person's getting up and healed. The, the bullet popped out or the bullet disappeared. Miracles. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Yeah. So that's, that's what we see. That's what God's going to do in the police. Revival, Revival in the police force. That's Revival. it. Revival in the police force. Revival. All right. So now, by the way, okay, this is not the, the actual message, but that was just prophecy. All right. This is, a, this is just entree. Okay. So now, now we can get to the main entree. Entree of love. So now we're going to go into... Into the into choosing love, walking in love, and let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter thirty, verse nineteen. And by the way, love is our breakthrough. Amen. Amen. Love will make a way for you every single time. Because remember something: the reason love doesn't fail is God is love. Amen. Can God fail? No. Is there anything too difficult for God? No. Is there anything too difficult for God? No. God is love. Amen. Is there anything too difficult for love? No. So we got to go on the love attack. So when you when we go into warfare, we must make sure we're using our number one. These two main weapons He's been given us is love and truth. Yes. Make sure you don't leave. You don't just go with the truth and you and you leave love behind. No. Do not leave love behind. Because no. if you go only with the truth and you don't have love. You're going to wound and you're going to cause chaos. Yes. You have to have love and truth. The truth spoken in love will bring deliverance. Amen. All right. So, so uh, you know, that's all of us. It starts with me. I mean, I have to. And God has been teaching me that for years because I didn't. I used to speak the truth more like the Pharisee spoke. You know, you just the truth, but you don't have any, you don't have any love. And God says, where's the love? So the love must always be a main ingredient of when you speak the truth. But then you get the flakies on the, on the other side. Look, you get the flakes on the left and the right. On the, on the right-hand side, you have the Pharisees who speak the truth without love. And on the left-hand side, you have the people that say, oh, love, 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 love. And meanwhile, there's no righteousness. And you can basically just do fluffy. You can just do anything you want. God loves you. You can sin. You can do whatever you want. God doesn't mind because he's like Father Christmas. Okay, that's now the sloppy agape people on the left. Or on the right, whatever, but it's on the ditch. We can't be on either ditch. We've got to be in the path. Okay. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth as a witnesses today against you. Interesting. You know, where, where, where do you get a, a situation where you got witnesses called against you? What is that only? It's only a court case, right? So God is actually saying, hey, I, remember when he speaks like this, he's the judge. He says, I'm calling the I'm calling heaven and earth as witnesses against you. And he's talking to the humanity, by the way. He was talking to Israel here, but he's talking to all of us. He says, there's a court case against you, oh man. All right, I'm calling heaven and earth against you as witnesses. They are your, they are the witnesses. Okay, so now we must like stand to attention. That I have said before you, not them, not the witnesses, you, 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 me, man, life and death. I've said before your life and death. He says, yeah, and he says this to every single man. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, just in case you didn't know, choose life. Just in, uh, just in case you thought you should be choosing death, he says, choose life. He gave you the answer. Open book test. He says, I said before life and death, choose life. Therefore, choose life. Now we know that life is who? Who's life? Jesus is life. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
So God is life and God is love. So when you say life, you include peace, love, joy, peace, uh, patience, kindness, the fruit of the spirit. God doesn't just have the fruit. He is the fruit. He is the fruit. Okay. He says that both you and your descendants, your children, it's very important for our children, may live. Say, my descendants will live. Because I choose life. Today. I choose life. I choose life every day. Therefore, I choose love. Every day, I choose love. Hallelujah. And then he says that you may love the Lord your God. Aha. So there's the first commandment. So if you choose love, that you may love that you may love. So if you want to know what life is, it's that so that you may love. So that's the math. God does maths. I don't know if you understand. God knows maths. And he invented maths, just by the way. And yes, some maths. He says, yes, the maths equation. If, if you choose life, that you may love the Lord. If you choose life, you will love God. You can't choose life and hate the Lord or disobey the Lord. Okay. Every time we choose life, we choose to obey God. He says that you may love the Lord your God and that you may, look here, love and obey his voice. You can't be loving God and disobeying God. It doesn't, that's a, that's an, a, that basically cancels out the entire mathematical equation. Okay. Love, God's love language is obedience. God's love language is obedience. So if you say, I love you, he says, he, che he checks the obedience behind you. He says, you say you love me, but you're not forgiving your brother. You're not loving your neighbor. You're cursing this one. You're slandering this one. You're doing this. So just put those hands down in the worship service. Get them down. Get them down. Stop worshiping. Switch the musical. Repent. <laughs> Repent. Go. Yeah. Leave your gift at the altar and be first be reconciled to your brother if you know that he has something against you. So we need to repent to people. Now, if they don't forgive you, that's the end of it. But you need to repent. Okay. We need to repent to the people that we know that are offended with us. Okay. Then it says here that you may, they may, um, that you may obey his voice and that they, uh, that you may cling to him. Mm. Did you know he says that you must obey his voice and that you must cling? You must cling. Did you know that you, you're called to cling? Mm. You know, like cling wrap. You're not cling wrappers. Yes. That plastic stuff. It's like clings to everything. Yep. He wants us to cling. Could you imagine a little child clinging? Uh, I, love, I love, I mean, that's a word and all. Are you clinging to Jesus? Do you self, you are clinging to Jesus. You're loving him. He says, cling to him for he is your life. He is your life. So when he says choose life, he's saying choose me because he says God is life. I, see that equation? There's a word life. He says choose life. And now he says your life. He says for he is your life. So he says choose God. Basically he says, I said before you, as a witness, before the witnesses today, heaven and earth. And he says, I, I, I said before you life, God and death. And who's death? What's his name? The devil, Satan, the dragon, whatever. He's got a whole got a bunch of deadly names. So he says, I've said before you God and the devil. And he says, choose God. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, choose love, choose life. And then he goes on and he says, so this, this is, a, uh, this is your, your basics in, in heavenly mathematics. If you don't understand this sum, all your other sums will go out. It's like if you don't understand one plus one is two, all your math is gone. If you don't understand basic subtraction, basic addi addition, multiplication, and division, and you start to move into a higher level mass, you're going to get it wrong the whole time because you don't understand your A, B, Cs. This is your A, B, C of, of, of God. He just says, so I'm, and this is in Deuteronomy, back in the, in the beginning of the book. And this is now when he started to train his people. He says, number one, you choose between God and the devil. Now, he didn't call the, 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 him the devil, but we know death. We know, we know that Jesus overcame death, right? When did he overcome death? On the cross. He, at the cross, he overcame death. And he's got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. All right. So he says, uh, choose life. So life came and swallowed up death. You know, there's a scripture that says he swallowed them. Swallowed. What a, he swallowed. That's how big he is. He's the, the witch. Yeah, he swallowed. See, that's he, that's that scripture there. 
He swallowed up death, hell, and the grave. He's swallowing up the, the spirits of the Sangomas and the witches and the wizards. He's swallowing them up. Dead is swallowed up by life. And he says, oh, grave, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? Woo, I feel anointing on that one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're getting it. Because now you're getting it. You're going to get revelation while we do math. All right. We're doing basic biblical math, mathematics. It's called revelation knowledge. So as I go in here, we go, we stop and we go deeper. All I did is just, I just put scriptures here. Then we go and then we get revelation. Because the spirit of revelation is upon you and he's in you. Hallelujah. We need to tap into revelation. So here it is. He says, for your, for he is your life and the length of your day. Say that he is my life and the length of my days. So who determines how old you get? He says to you, just in case you think your time is close to go. go. He says to, to those who believe in me, though they shall die, he says, you'll never die. He says, you'll never die. If you believe in me, you'll never die. You'll never be separated. So it's not about how long you live on this earth. He says, you will never die. You'll never experience death, which is separation from God. You'll never experience that death. And if he wants you to live 120 years like he did with Moses, you'll live till 120. Mm -hmm. So then you, when you think you're getting older, if you're in your 70s, 80s, he says, no, still spring chicken. You still, you, still, you, you, you still got like the best part of 40 years to go mm -hmm. to get to, to Moses' age mm -hmm. under old covenant. And he was climbing mountains at 120. He didn't have a, he didn't have a rolling chair, wheelchair, whatever chair. He wasn't there on a stretcher. He walked up the mountain. Yes. He didn't say, oh, someone help me up. He walked up the mountain. Amen. All right. So God wants us to experience resurrection life in our bones, yes. in our flesh, yes. in your eyesight. Some people said, I'm getting old. My eyes are getting weak. I said, where, where, where did you see Moses go and get prescription glasses? So what I'm saying, I'm not, look, no, not if you wear glasses, that's, that's not an issue. But I'm just saying, Moses' eyes were bright at the age of 120. You understand, we accept a lot of things because of old age, like losing your mind. That's just one of the benefits of losing. One of the things of old age benefits actually occurs. There in the Bible, it doesn't say you've got to lose your mind. It says you've got the mind of Christ. And it says you go from glory to glory to glory. So where does it say you, the older you get, you're going to actually start losing your, your memory? What book did you read to find that in? Huh? Imagine. Yeah, well, the devil's book. Okay, because that's not what God says in his book. We talk, remember, we got the book of, the Bible's the book of life. The devil's got another book. Amen. What's his book called? The, book of, the, the book of death. Yeah, the book of the world. All right, so anyway, he says, length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. So what is the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us what is the land what is the land that he is given to us that even abraham didn't even enter into the land that we're called to go into what is that land called we in, in one word it's the promised land but what is your promised land it's your calling yes but do you, you know what do, do you know what it is it's called it's it's the salvation of your soul yeah. i'm not talking about born again Born again is the beginning of the salvation of your life. But when you get born again, your soul is not saved. Yeah. It's like, what? No, it's saved from the hell, obviously. No, you know, we're not talking about eternal life and going, you know, going to hell. When you get born again, your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, they're not completely saved. They were bought with a price. And now you still think with rubbish in your head. You still got nonsense in your head. You still got a, an evil will, a stubborn will. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. But this, but this, but this. Emotionally, you're unstable because you're like a yo-yo. Up and down, up and down. God's not emotionally inst inst unstable. All right. So when you get born again, the promised land for you, just by the way, is not, uh, uh, you know, people think it's a land of milk and money. And so what happens is they think the promised land is lots of money. And I, I know a lot of people with money and they don't have any peace and joy. So, the, so let me explain what the promised land is for you. It is the kingdom of God 
maturing inside of you. Amen. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the promised land. So we've got our eyes off of what the promised land is. And we think promised land is healthy body and lots of money. And an easy life with a picket fence and, and a dog and a, a, a three Mercedes Benz. That's what we think Jesus came to die for. And that is the perversion of the gospel. That's the Babylonian gospel. But the real inheritance for you and me is that you will have peace, love, and joy so that if you're put in jail for the, for the work of, cross, of the cross, you still got love, peace, and joy. Whether you're sitting in jail or a mansion, you got love, peace, and joy. You can be sitting in a mansion complaining about the 500-inch the TV set that's not working and getting upset with the repairman because he didn't come within an hour. You know, you, know, you know those people that are very, like, difficult. They've got lots of money, but they're always upset. Mm. Why are they upset? Because they don't have the kingdom of God within them. Mm. So whether you're in a palace or you're in prison, mm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. That's the promised land. All right. And God says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, whatever, things, physical things will be added. But that's not our primary thing. Mm. Our primary thing is not the big house and the car and healthy body. Now, God has provided a healthy body. God has provided the provision. God has said, I'll feed you. God has says, I'll provide for you. Yes, that's a given. But the promised land for a believer is that you can go through hell and still have peace. Yes. You can have, go through hell and still have joy. That is the promised land. So that nothing on the outside will affect the life on the inside. Okay. Because the more they beat you up, the more the glory shines. So they can never win. They can never get Christ down because it's can they tried that once and it didn't work because he was raised from the dead. Now the resurrected Christ is in you. How are they going to kill him again? <laughs> they, can't, they can't kill him again. He's the resurrected Jesus and he lives. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He says, do you believe? He says, do you think they can kill me again? Do you think they're going to take me to hell again? No. Never. You they can't take me. So what you got to do is say, the, resurrection, the resurrected one lives in me and they're never going to get me down because Jesus cannot go down again. And they basically they're trying to take you and get you get you to take Jesus down and get depressed. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching the series now, part four parts. If you haven't listened to that, go and listen to the four part series on how to never be depressed again in your life. Mm -hmm. Never get depression. Depression is not your inheritance. Mm -hmm. That's the book of death. Mm -hmm. That comes out of Satan's book. Mm -hmm. How are we going to make make mankind depressed? And kill themselves? Jeez, you know what? If you kill yourself, the devil doesn't even have to do anything. <laughs> Could you imagine? It's like, you know. You can't kill you because you're dead already. No, but he's, he's, he gets people to kill themselves. Even Christians commit suicide. So if he gets you to kill yourself, then he, his job is done. He, in fact, he can just sit there and watch you kill yourself. And how does he do that? He gets you to take your eyes off Jesus. All right, so let's go to the next scripture now. So he says, choose life. So you've chosen life. I've chosen life. Today we choose life. Tomorrow we choose life again. So now we go to. 1 Corinthians, you know it's going to happen, 13. The love chapter. Now, look, yeah, we can camp out here for a while. But there's so many, there's so much, there's so much jewelry, jewelry here. There's so many jewels. There's so much pearls here. But now when you pursue it, you're going to see it from another angle today. You're going to see it again like you've never seen it again. Here we go. Verse 1. So we're going to go through the whole chapter. The whole chapter. Don't know if we'll finish today. But let's just start. Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. That's talking about, we're talking about speaking in the normal language and speaking in tongues. But I have not love. I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Sure. So what that's saying is if we don't walk in this kind of love, that the Lord is saying them as walking. You know what's going to happen? We're just going to be what God will call, you, you will call us a big noise. We are a big noise if, if we don't walk in love. Okay. 
It says here, verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy, now the gift of prophecy says you must desire to prophesy. The gift of prophecy is a wonderful gift from God. He says, if I've got the gift of prophecy, all right, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. That's a very serious statement. So he's saying you can have all these gifts that you like, all these gifts, the gift of prophecy, the gift of understanding, all mysteries, you can have all knowledge. So in other words, you can be the greatest Bible teacher on earth. You can be the greatest prophet on earth. Now, you know, there's, there's I mean, we people look up to people like Paul Cain, Bob Jones, who could re read your mail from a mile away. I think Paul Cain, Paul Cain is most probably the one that's walked in the most powerful gifts of prophecy. Yeah, those guys. So God's saying, you can have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. And have all knowledge. Do you know anyone that knows everything? Not yet. <laughs> Only Jesus. Now, could you imagine knowing all knowledge? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, how do you even get to that all that knowledge in your head? I don't know. But uh, all knowledge is all knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, think of all the knowledge yeah. about the Bible and all the university. He says you can have all knowledge. Now, people really look up to people with knowledge. Mm -hmm. PhD. You can have 5,000 PhDs. Imagine having 5,000 PhD. Have you ever heard of someone with 10,000 PhD? You can have 20,000 PhDs. You can make uh, Einstein look like uh, kindergarten. And he says, if you, he says, yeah, and you can understand mysteries, not just knowledge. And you can have all faith so that you can actually, do you know anyone that's been moving mountains? Lately, like, like Table Mountain. Last week, he moved that into the sea. This guy, one person moved. Do you, you understand? He's saying you can move mountains. You can have all the knowledge. I mean, you're going to be hyper spiritual. You're going to be more spiritual than anyone that's ever been on the earth. Even Jesus wasn't doing all this, moving mountains and things like that. So you can actually be more spiritual than Jesus, move more mountains. And he says, if you have not love, you are nothing. That means that that's remember we're doing maths again. Nothing means zero. You, you're like a zip. In God's book, he says you are nothing. Now, man would be writing books about you. They'll be talking about you, your greatness for centuries. And God says, you are nothing. That's shocking. There are many people that man esteem that God says they are nothing. Many. All right. So God's saying, no, I don't want you to look at that. Knowledge puffs up, love edifies. So he said years ago, he says, you get puffed up the more knowledge you get. Mm. But the more love you get, you grow up. Mm. It says la knowledge puffs up and, and love edifies. Mm. So it's the difference between a balloon. A person with a lot of knowledge is like a balloon, mm. a hot air balloon that goes pop when they get to the end of their, their stretchiness. But a person full with love is like solid as a rock and, and it's got living stones. So the difference between an air balloon that goes big quickly and a person that's solid is a person that walks in love. He says, yeah, and though I bestow all my goods, now we are talking about a person that's really compassionate. A person that gives all their goods. I don't know, do you know anybody that's done this? Gave everything they own to feed the poor. Hmm. All right. I mean, that sounds like a righteous brother now. I mean, that, that'd get the front seat in the church. He'd get, he, he, you know, he'd be honoring what, what, what. And then on top of that, he didn't just give all his money to the poor. He gave his body to be burnt. Do you know anyone whose body's been burnt lately? For the poor or for what? A martyr. A martyr. Mm. And he says, but you have not love. It profits me nothing. Can you imagine giving all your money? To the poor. I mean, that, I mean, you could really, that's like, sounds really good. I mean, giving your money to the poor, it sounds, this guy really lives mm. for God, huh? Mm. And on top of that, he died on a stake burning. God, you don't have love, you're nothing. Mm. Now, this is very important because this, this, this is, we are heading towards uh, the judgment seat of Christ. So when you get to the judgment seat, this scripture is there to judge you. So let's get ready for the judgment because that's one thing you're going to go to. 
Guaranteed you will all be at the judgment. And we're trusting we, we, we we're at the right judgment, not at the white throne judgment. <laughs> we want Christ's judgment for the church, not the white throne, because that's now. That's another ball game, that judgment. Amen. So we want to be at the judgment seat of Christ. When he reads the scripture to us, he can say to you, well done, Rion. Well done. You, you learn to love. Amen. Well done. You learn to love, kids. You learn to love. You learn to love. Because when Bob Jones went to, died and went to heaven, the Lord said, there's one question you asked. Everyone gets asked when they get to heaven. Oh. Did you learn to love? Mm. Not did you learn to preach? Did you learn to heal the sick? Did you learn to prophesy? Oh my goodness, we're exalting these prophets like nobody's business. But he says, exalt love. Wow. Exalt love. Okay? And remember chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians 13 is sandwiched between 12 and 14 of 1 Corinthians, which is talking about the gifts. So you've got the gifts on the left and the right, right in the be beginning. He gives us a good slap and he says, focus on love. Because love is more important than the gifts. And if you exalt the gifts above love, you're going to miss the boat. Because he says you can prophesy like better than Bob Jones and you're still, you're still nothing. You can prophesy better than Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Revelator. I mean... He says you can understand all mysteries, but you don't have love, you're nothing. And then he says, yeah. Now he starts the definition of love. And this is why we need to study this so that and focus on this so that we can become love. Because this is our main objective, to become love. Now, I know this is not like a popular teaching. Most churches, they don't like to preach this. No. Because it's got nothing to do with your back, uh, your your checkbook, and it's got nothing to do with your body. And most most people want to know about success, but true success is walking in love. Amen. That is true success. Okay, he says, "Yeah, love." Listen to the first one. Love suffers long. My Bible says suffers long. Some people say pa some Bibles say patient. I say no. It says suffers long because that's really the description. It means that you're going to suffer for a long time. Mm. Love suffers long. Amen. Love suffers long. Wow. Love suffers long. Are you excited about love now? No, nah, I want ah, no. Give me patience. I want it now. My one says love is large and incredibly patient. Wow. Yeah, they, well, I wouldn't say incredibly, incredibly patient. So what happens is love suffers long. That tells me that you're going to suffer for a long time. Mm. No, I'm talking That's that true. you're going to suffer for a long, a long time. So if you're going to suffer for a long time. You're going to have to have a lot of patience because people will cause you trouble. Demons will cause you trouble. So he didn't say anything else first. He puts love suffers long as the first thing. It's a priority. Patience is a priority of your life. But we don't put, have you ever heard of a patience conference? Have you ever heard long suffering conference? We're doing a long suffering conference. How long is it? It's going to be quite a long time. <laughs> huh? We're going to have all God. Faith conscious. We're going to have proper. Have you ever heard of a, a long suffering conference? Yeah. Or a humility one? How are we going to do humility conference? We're going to get lots of people. Most probably three people pitch up. <laughs> it's interesting. What we think is important. Con con compared to what God says is important. So he says, so this is the definition of love. So God's saying, remember, wherever you see the word love, you can actually put the God. Amen. So you can say God suffers long. Amen. Oh my goodness. God suffers long. Yes. He suffers long with me. Just think how long he's suffering with you. Mm. Without answers. Mm. He says, I want you to have that same kind of patience. Mm. Huh? Yeah. With all those people around you. Mm. And they haven't been hassling you for 40 or 500 years. Mm. Look at you guys. Mm. God is long-suffering. Otherwise, he would have wiped us out long ago. All right. But anyway, let's carry on. That's so, so, so suffering long is a positive or a negative. What do you think it is? Is that a positive or a negative in your books? When you, when you hear long-suffering, does that say a positive or a negative in your, in your check account? It's positive. It's a positive. There's no negatives in God. <laughs> but normally in our minds, like, uh, no, I think we'll do away with that one. Let's let's move on. Is there something better than this one? Oh, yeah, it says love is kind. I like that one. Let's let's leave the suffering. So we would rather move on to kindness and leave out long suffering. 
Mm. And he says, now it's all inclusive. It's a complete package. Mm. It's a package deal. Mm. Long suffering and kindness. So while you're suffering long, this is what he's saying. You must be kind. <laughs> you know the difficult time to be kind is, is when you're in pain. Because then you want to kick the dog or you want to hurt somebody or you, you want to just, you know, slash out and say, you know what, get off my cat. Yeah, you don't, you're, yeah, you're feeling a little bit uh, touchy. So let's say I'm a bit sensitive. I've had a rough day. Don't give me any more. Mm -hmm. Just let me relax here. And don't push my buttons. Mm -hmm. You know those buttons. Mm -hmm. Has anyone got buttons that can be pushed? Yep. Yep. All right. Now, you know there's a solution for those buttons. Amen. It's called die to self, and there will be no more buttons. Amen. All right, those buttons are dealt with at the cross. But yes, if our flesh is alive, we will have a button and someone will be able to push it. Mm -hmm. The reason there's still a button is because you're not dead. Yes. Dead people don't have buttons. Have you ever seen it? You go to a grave, you talk to the person, tell him his mother's ugly, spit in his face, stab him. You see, you're going to see any buttons. No buttons are happening on dead Amen. people. No buttons. But us, don't push my buttons. I'm very sensitive. I thought that was like I thought that was like a, a gift. Sensitivity. I thought no. I just I'm very sensitive. I get offended easily. Now that, that was years ago, decades ago. I thought it was a gift to be sensitive and easily offended. It's, I thought it was like discernment or something. <laughs> you know, some people say I've got a gift of discernment. Meanwhile, they've got a, 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 a it's it's a curse of slander. They think they're discerning everybody. Meanwhile, they're talking about him. And so, so the Lord said to me, look, the reason you're so sensitive and you get easy offended is because you're so immature, like a baby. Wow. So grow up now and get a thick skin. It's called long-suffering skin, like a rhino. But a rhino skin you need. So in other words, you can endure pain Without complaining. Oh, you know, I've been in this traffic for five hours. I can't take it anymore. I've been at home affairs in the long queue. I've had enough. <laughs> Throw the toys out the cot like a good, bad Christian. Because that's when you get tested, is when you're in the bank, in the home affairs, or in the, in the traffic. Or someone cuts you off and you, you wish you had a gun. You want to shoot them. But you know you're a pastor. And then they're pointing signs at you. And it's not uh -huh. like, it's not signs of the traffic. It's some other sign. <laughs> and you get, da, 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 da. he said, what's that? Da, 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 da. What, what? That thing is supposed to be dead. You, that thing's a dead. What, you, what is it like? What are you manifesting like a, what, manifest like a demon? You're supposed to be dead to that thing. Dead. D-E-A, dead. Supposed to have your death certificate. Rest in peace. That's what you give a dead man. Rest in peace. If you don't, you're not dead. You don't get rip on your grave. There's no rest in peace if you're not dead. That's why you don't have peace, because you're not dead. Only the dead have peace. So if you don't have peace, it's because you're not dead. You just got to accept you're dead. It's no longer I that live. What is that? That's your death certificate. Galatians 2.20 says you're dead. Amen. It is no longer I that live. It means you're dead. Why are we so sensitive? It's because you're not dead. You don't believe you're dead. Oh. The problem is a lack of faith. We don't believe in it. We don't believe we're dead. You'll never die if you don't believe. You'll be all walking around half dead, hitting people with the cross. He didn't say hit people with a cross. <laughs> I've seen people hit people with crosses. Oh. Literally. They were marching somewhere. Years ago, I saw it on TV. They had this religious demonstration. And then you had all these guys dressed up in their garments and but they had these wooden crosses, like small ones, big ones, and they had a fight, and they were hitting each other with it. <laughs> like, they're taking each other with crosses. Like, yes. But that's like the church. We walk around hitting each other with a cross. He no. says, take up the cross, not as a knob kitty, <laughs> and die on that, on that cross, and let your brother nail you, and then say, I forgive you. While you're dying, like Jesus said, forgive them. I forgive you. Like Father forgave me, I forgive you. I forgive that guy. The moment you forgive, you get grace. Amen. And the door opens for you. Amen. Hallelujah. So now you know, you've got a little view on long-suffering and kindness. And long-suffering and kindness is not separate things. They're together. All right? 
So he wants you not only to be long-suffering, he wants you to be kind while you're suffering. So while you've got the rats eating your toes and, you, and, you, and, you, and you're strapped in jail and you have had no food and you haven't showered for two years and you smell like a rat, God still wants you to be kind. Wow. Because Paul was in a rat hole. Paul was in a jail with no uh, ablution blocks and showers. Do you, can you imagine what a, a jail looks like 2,000 years ago? What was those jails looking at? And Paul was, Paul was writing letters from those jails. And he was writing letters telling, like in Philippians, he was in the Philippian jail. He's writing there, Re rejoice in the Lord always. Always. In jail, he's saying always. And again, I say rejoice. And this guy's telling people that are outside in their comfortable homes to rejoice, which they can't do. But he's sitting there rejoicing in jail. Wow. That's a testimony of a true apostle. <laughs> Everyone wants to call themselves apostles. That is the a testimony of apostle, suffering. And when you suffer, endure suffering as a good soldier. Okay. So the Lord has called us into suffering. Well, maybe we, hey, that'll be. Can you imagine there we can have a conference? Call it the, the long suffering conference. God's called you to suffering. Sign up now. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Let's go to the, the BBB prophets. Babies, blessings, and bucks. Prophesy, Papa, prophesy. I just want to hear babies, blessings, and bucks. That's the Babylonian prophets. Those are the prophets of Baal. All over the place, making millions flying in jets. And yeah, he has the truth. Paul is a true pro a prophet. These other guys are non prophets. There's a bunch of non prophets. <laughs> because they're not prophets. A true prophet is, is like Paul. You want to be a prophet like a New Testament prophet? Go through the sufferings of Paul. And then if you don't like that, Go with John, Isle of Patmos. See if you can handle the boiling oil. He went through boiling oil. They couldn't even kill him. Have you ever have you ever put your hand in an oil pot when you're putting the chips in? Paul, I mean, John, the revelator, the one that got the book of Revelation, they put him in a boiling pot of oil and they couldn't kill him. How would you like that? Would you be complaining and writing letters to the newspaper? How they're mistreating you. They didn't give you the front chair. They took your chair. They didn't greet you at the altar. They didn't call you pastor and deacon and doctor what what. Therefore, I'm resigning. I'm offended. But did they put you in oil? No. So what are you complaining about? And when they put you in oil, he says rejoice. You didn't come out like a chip. John didn't die in the hot oil. But he never wrote letters about how he, how he was put in the oil. And how God let him down because he was trusting him for a mansion. And here he was in the Isle of Patmos in a pit, writing the, one of the greatest books ever written, the book of Revelation, in a pit. And yeah, we are complaining because we're having load shedding. How much load shedding was going on in the Isle of Patmos? I can tell you none. none. No load shedding. There was just no light. No light. <laughs> All right, so no load shedding is uncomfortable. But it's just to waken up something in you to get you in the flesh. But if you take load shedding with a, with a pinch of salt and you become the salt, then you can rejoice every time the lights go out. And again, you understand how we're stumbling over little pebbles. And we think of the great men and women of God that really suffered and what they did in suffering. And we are like missing the boat completely because we become mamby pamby babies. And we're not soldiers. We like still like babies complaining about everything. And I'm, I'm including myself. And by the way, we're talking about love now. Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is love. So when you say, God, fill me with your love, you say, fill me with long suffering. And some people, you know, I've heard people say this. They never pray for patience. They say, because if you pray for patience, you're going to get tribulations. Because tribulations produces patience. 
So they figured out that they can outmaneuver God and say, I don't want patience because I don't want tribulations. And they're thinking, what are you, are you crazy? Do you think you're cleverer than God now? I pray for patience a lot. I say, Lord, I need a lot of this stuff because I need your ability to suffer for a long time because I've got suffering and I better have the grace to suffer, otherwise I'll collapse. You're going to go suffer through suffering. Whether you like it or not, you'll be going through suffering. So what you need, the, the, the word, the, the fruit of patience, the, the fruit of patience is one of the highest level fruits you can get. And the, one of the highest levels on the mountain. Before you get to the top of the mountain, one of the highest levels is called patience. And lots of people don't get past that level because they don't have patience. And you can be 400 years old and still be impatient. Just because you, patience doesn't come with age. It comes with suffering and rejoicing and receiving it. So I say, Lord, give me patience, which is the grace to suffer a long time. So it's time and pain. Now, take that equation now. Pain for a long time. Does that sound like a nice equation? God says, I am this. God is love. So if you want to say who God is, God says, God suffers long. So do you want to become like God? Christ-likeness is like God-likeness. Do you like the glory of God? This, by the way, are we talking about the glory here? Isn't this glory? Long-suffering? <laughs> no, no. I'll excuse that part. People think the gospel and the kingdom is like pick and pay. You can pick and pay whatever you want. You can say, ah, I don't want carrots. I don't want spinach. I don't want vegetables. I just want candy floss. I just want chocolates and whispers and, you know, fluff. Huh? He says, no, no, no. You need a balanced diet. And just to start you guys off with a decent diet, we'll start off with long suffering on your menu. Uh, no, skip that one. You know, I'm not into carrot uh, starters. Long suffering. Where's the first place that Jesus takes you when you get saved? Tell me. Does he take you to the palace or does he take you to the desert? The wilderness. The wilderness. Isn't that strange? Do you know that most Christians get offended in the wilderness because they didn't get the, the Mercedes? The only bends, they, they want that the Mercedes bends, the only thing that bends is the head. <laughs> I can't fathom that they didn't get what God told them they're going to get. They were trusting God for a Mercedes, and yeah, they are with the scorpions and the snakes <laughs> in the wilderness. And then it tells us in the Bible, that's the first place he takes you. In Deuteronomy 8, he tells you, he takes you into the wilderness to test you, to show you what is in your heart, to teach you that man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. Amen. But now we want to get saved and we say, seven steps to success. If I don't get all this money, I get offended with God and I'm going to leave the church and try another church until I find some Babylonian prophet that I have to pay so he can prophesy over me so I can get more money. Mm. And that's what's going on. That's it's terrible. It's shocking. It's very terrible. And so now God is sifting out the true church and the true church of those are saying, Lord, I love you enough to suffer for you. Now, please, let me just exclude inner suffering. Sickness is not included in, in the package deal. There is specific suffering that God's got for you. You must know that you can claim that. <laughs> but do not, the sickness is not part of the package. So you can be, say, hallelujah. Okay. All right. And by the way, Neither is poverty. Yeah. Okay? Neither is poverty. Poverty means you can't pay, you can't, don't have food on the table, and you can't have a, you know, clothes on your back. That's poverty. All right. So, but it doesn't mean that you can have a 5,000 bedroom house now. All right? Some people think that's now what God's promised everybody. That'll be in heaven. But on earth, at least you'll have a house and you'll have clothing and whatever. Sufficient for, Sufficient for the day he's giving you. But what God has... God doesn't want you to suffer sickness. One second. Jesus was never getting delivered from headaches. And so now, what is the suffering that he's promised you? Do you know that he's promised you suffering? Have you claimed your suffering yet? People say, you're crazy. I say, you understand. He's, he, in, the, in the Constitution, he's promised suffering. He says, when you're persecuted, by the way, that's your suffering. For my name's sake. He says, you must be glad and get exceedingly rejoice because great is your reward in heaven so when you get persecuted you must be rejoicing 
when you come and the devil comes against you and all hell breaks against us like it, it has been in the last five, ten years, whatever, we're supposed to be rejoicing mm -hmm. because you're being counted worthy to suffer for the gospel. But normally what we do is we, we get discouraged. We look at ourselves. There's something wrong with us just because you're getting attacked. If you're in an army, listen now. Okay, you sign up for the army. Uh, anyone here ever been in the army? Okay, army, army. Okay, I've been in the army. If you're in the army and you go to war, are you going to complain when they start shooting at you? <laughs> are you going to say, I didn't sign up for this. What is this? Bullets. People are getting shot. Look at that guy got wounded. I'm out of here. What is this? A picnic. We are soldiers. And soldiers get shot at. And if you get wounded, you need to have a hospital and you need to get healed. and get. So if you get shot in the line of duty, it is something to rejoice in because you suffered for your country. You don't shoot the wounded, which the church, by the way, they're big on shooting the wounded. You get wounded and they want to take out the gun and finish the job. <laughs> oh, you got wounded. Let me shoot you again. Must be something wrong with you. So we shoot the wounded. We're the only army that shoots the wounded. We're the only army that don't respect the wounded and don't honor the wounded and don't get them healed and complain when we are wounded. Actually, that's your badge of honor. <laughs> Do you know that in the army, if you go in a battle and you get wounded, in a battle, most times you're going to get a medal for this. In God's army, it's the same. When you get wounded because you're in battle and you got shot and you got wounded, you get a medal in heaven. Every wound that you get, you get a medal for it. Mm. So your long suffering is working for you an exceeding great reward in heaven. So the problem is you'll only find, if you don't get the revelation now, you'll only find out when it's too late in heaven one day. You think, geez, I should have had more suffering on earth. Look at this. Here I am sitting with this little, you know, the three room. <laughs> And this guy that suffered, he's got a hundred room apartment. You'll be rewarded for suffering for him. Not suffering because you're stupid or foolish. Now, obviously, you can suffer because you're foolish all day. But if you suffer for him, you'll be rewarded for it. But we don't take the mindset that Paul had and John the and John the Baptist. We don't understand the mindset of the early church. We've got this new age mindset that says suffering is evil, it's wrong, and we shouldn't suffer. It says there's no suffering in heaven. But Jesus says, if I suffered, you suffer with me. If I was persecuted, you'll suffer, you'll be persecuted with me. So we need to rejoice in every time we suffer. We need to rejoice in the Lord. And while we are suffering, he says, be kind. There's a test. While you're in pain and you've got pipes stuck in you, your chest is open, you've got wounds everywhere, and you're very sensitive. And someone comes along and says something. God says, just remember to be kind. While you're bleeding. Be kind. Thinking, I should actually have a little bit of grace here. And God's saying, be kind, because then you're behaving just like me. How kind was Jesus on the cross? At that point on the cross, when those two thieves next to him was talking, you should have just said, shut the hell up. You, you guys are going to hell. I don't want to hear your nonsense. Do you know I'm suffering here? And I did nothing wrong. Did you ever hear Jesus say that? Was he kind on the cross? Was he suffering? He says, do, just do the same. So while you're hanging around on those nails that your brothers put in your hands, because the brothers are always there to nail you. You know the brothers. You'll always have to have them to nail you, because you can't nail yourself, brother. You can't nail yourself. You understand it? You have to have a volunteer to do this. So you got very, you got, you got people, I got them queuing up to nail me. I mean, I don't have to look far. They want to nail you, right? So then you're supposed to say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Did you are getting nailed again? And then God said, love your enemies. And then you pray for them that, that, that spitefully use you. You pray for those that persecute you. You bless your enemies. You pray for them. And he says, now that's love. And that's supernatural love. That's not something you can do in your own strength. And so the hardest lesson God ever taught me, still teaching me, is love my enemies. Love my enemies. Yeah, and not just forgive them. No, forgiving them is easy. Now, that's step for, for me, forgiving is easy. Loving them is more difficult. <laughs> it's like, ah, it took me, it took me years to, to get that message, to understand what that means and how important it is for God. So if you've got a lot of enemies, you, 
you got you get very blessed because a lot of love is gonna gonna come out of you. And love is God. And where God is, you never fail. So if we can uh, overcome the fear of our, of our enemies, and that was one of the things that I, I've been tested with. You, if you don't love your enemies, you'll be afraid of them. Always. I've seen it. So God says, you're not loving them. You're afraid of them. Oh, please remove them. Just, just get them out of my life. It's like thorn bushes. Walking into thorn bushes. Some people are like, a, not just a, a thorn, it's a bush. You walk in there, it's like... Oh, oh. Oh Lord, deliver me. I, I can't take it anymore. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, I will rejoice in my infirmities. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. He says, I take pleasure in these infirmities and these trials and these and these attacks. Did you, did you get that one? That to me is one of the highest level statements he ever said. I take pleasure in these trials. Are you taking pleasure in your trials? Have you got to the place of Paul? That's true apostolic. You want to be apostolic? Go through the sufferings of Paul and, and have his attitude. That's apostle. The people that walk around apostles, they're like golden products, network marketers. They're not, they're not, they don't have the stripes. They don't have the authority and the demons laugh in them. Mm. The authority that you get is coming through your suffering. Mm. That's your, the stripes that go on your back. That's your authority. Your authority gets greater and greater the more suffering you go through. So have you ever prayed for have you ever prayed for more annoying? Did you ever pray for more annoying? Oh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> so did you have to go to Gethsemane to get the oil? How are you going to get more oil unless you go for a bit of crushing? You know, Gethsemane means crushing. It's the olive press. In other words, you want oil? You got to go through a bit of... <laughs> have you ever seen what happens to an olive under the millstone? So when you want more anointing, you're asking for more crushing. Because the oil is inside of you. It's Christ in you. He says, there's just one, there's one limitation between the oil and you. It's you. And you have to disappear. And the oil is going to flow out of you like crazy. <laughs> it's this hard shell that has to be crushed. You know, a guy that knows this and, 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 and had a tremendous revelation of this crushing experience is uh, Watchman Nee. If you want to read a book that will kill you, read Watchman Nee's books. But he's in heaven now. He's the, the father of the Chinese church. Watchman Nee. Called Releasing the Spirit. Huh? And he's got a thin version and a thick one. Most people can't read the thick one. It'll, it's just too intense. He's so intense. But all it is about is that he's saying that inside is God's glory and the outside is the flesh. And the flesh has to be crushed and broken for the glory to come out. It's called releasing the spirit. So every trial and tribulation you go through that God allows in your life is to release the glory within. And the glory is coming out when you learn to rejoice in it and you're praising the Lord and you've got joy in the middle of a major tribulation. That's how you know you're getting ready to pass the test. You're ready to pass the test when you're rejoicing in your suffering. That's it. If you're not rejoicing, you're not mature. And if you're not mature, you don't get the car keys. People want the, they want the keys. They want the cars. They want the anointings. They want the authority. He says, no, no, no. Pass the test and you get the car. Get your license. What's your license? Long suffering. Test number one, two, three. How many years did Joseph wait to be put into his position? How many years of suffering did Joseph go through? How many years, years, not months, did David go through to be promoted? How many years did Jesus suffer before he had three years of three and a half years of ministry? That's it. What was he doing for 30 years? Suffering. Patience. Can't I start my ministry now? He's at 12. He can preach better than anyone in all of Israel. He's at 12. He was ready to. He, he could have started ministry at 12. Better ministry than all of us. God says, No, you're not ready yet. Sonny, you still got training. 
that D. That's a, that that that's that's old. To start ministering when you actually you're already preaching at twelve. Thirty years for three and a half years of ministry. We want three months for thirty years of ministry. Anyway, so God is giving us wisdom and God's giving us love, and He says, "Make love preeminent." And we need to pursue love, and now we know how to pursue love, pursue long suffering. I'm not saying you have to ask God for suffering. Don't worry, it's it's already a package deal. It's there for you. But when it comes, no, He won't allow you to suffer more than you're supposed to. Don't worry. So everyone gets their little dish. It's all prepared for you. But He won't allow you to suffer more than you're supposed to. But the main thing is, are you rejoicing or are you complaining? And he says today, I said before you, life and death, in your suffering, will you choose life? Will you choose love? And if you choose love, you'll choose long suffering. And if you choose death, you'll say complaining. And if you complain, you're going to stay in your suffering. It doesn't get rid of your suffering. Those guys died in their suffering in the wilderness. 40 years of complaining. Where did they die? Eating manna. They didn't even get to the pizzas. They didn't get to the promised land. All they complaining never got them to the promise. So they died in their suffering. Do you know that when you complain, your suffering doesn't go. It gets worse. So suffering is like a stupid thing. Like really stupid. Complaining never gets you out of suffering. Do you know what gets you out of suffering? Pass the test. And then you get a testimony. Pass the test. What's the test? Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again, I say rejoice, says a man, Paul, that man and David, to me, those two suffered the most for, for the longest periods of suffering. Suffered tremendous. For years, they suffered. Heartache, pain. I don't know which one suffered more, but they suffered. So you go and read that, what they wrote in the Psalms and go and read what Paul wrote in, the, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. It's like mind-blowing. All through, when you read Paul's letters, like, and you know what he went through, thinking, how can this guy write this stuff? Huh? Rejoice. What kind of rejoicing are you going to do there with the rat on your head? You didn't even know when you get your food and these like little mice eating your food and then these, what do you call those things? Maggots? It's like, oh. Oh. We have no clue what Paul went through. But just go and read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and you'll get, and you'll get his testimony. Then you'll understand the, 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 why Paul had so much authority. Because he had chapter 11 and chapter 12. Mm. That was his testimony. Mm. Mm. He had a testimony of suffering and overcoming. Mm. And the church in China has got authority over dead people and they raise the dead like, like you, you, you heal headaches. Mm. It's because they're suffering church. Mm. They suffer in China. They go, to, they go to jail. They lose their families for 10 years. They, don't, they, they, go to, they get killed. Yeah. You might break a nail or someone didn't greet you. You lost your chair, your favorite chair. That's the only thing we expect. And the lockdowns that we've had now is nothing compared to the suffering that they go through in China. So now we must say, oh, prepare for suffering. Long suffering. So the more suffering you get, the more you rejoice. The happier you become. You just... You're just invincible now. Could you imagine every time you suffer, you lose your head? <laughs> Fantastic. I see that. I see that mansion growing bigger and bigger. Hallelujah. I think we put another room on there. <laughs> I, need a, I think I need a new paddock for the horses here. Amen. We're talking about your, your mansion in heaven. Amen. You basically, you know that you, God, all the suffering you got through, He's preparing your mansion. Amen. That's your long term investment, by the way. Amen. That's your retirement plan. Amen. And he says, if you learn to rejoice, you're going to get greater. He says, why does he say, go ballistic? I'm going to go and read it. And let's, we'll finish it now because I can carry on all day now. Because now you can see I'm on my, one of my topics. This is a, a very important topic for me. Suffering. God told me long ago about suffering. Then I said, okay, Lord, I'll give it to me. So I know, you know, I said, oh, I'm prepared to suffer for you. That was in 1996. I didn't realize what was coming my way. And what kind of suffering? I thought it was like jail or something. And I think jail would have been easier. Jail would have been easier. Or death would have been much easier. No, I've got shot or something. Shot in Jerusalem. I don't know. Then it would have been over. How long? 
lead a bit, die, go to heaven, get a, get a reward, martyr. And, and it's like, no, 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 no. You have to die daily for years. It's like, oh, geez. But you don't choose your suffering. I'm not talking about suffering sickness or being stupid. The suffering that we suffer is for the sake of Jesus and because we love him. Just think how you can prove your love. Every time you suffer, you say, thank you, Lord. I can suffer for you. Because you suffered for me, I suffer for you. And that's why I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to suffer for you. Because you suffered for me. I think, it's, I think, I think that's how I can show him my love. It doesn't prove my love to him that, oh, Lord, look, look how patient I am with all these blessings you've given me. Just look how I appreciate all these blessings. Look at this new car. Thank you, Lord. He says, no, but your true love is tested when you suffer. Do you know you've got a true marriage when you suffer together? And you come out of the suffering together. But when you go through suffering together, then your marriage will be tested. Because that's what actually destroys most marriages, is when, when it hits the fan, somebody says, you know what? I'm out of this thing. I didn't sign up for this. I just want blessings. But if you learn to suffer together mm. and overcome suffering as a couple or a church, mm. God will then trust you with his authority and his glory. Yeah. That's what he wants to give you. He wants to reward us with the glory that's coming. But the glory comes through suffering. The glory can come through tests. Unfortunately, most people don't even preach that. Because they want to just say, oh, the glory is there. You don't have to go through anything. You're not going to go through suffering. You're not going to go through tests. It's just yours. You just claim it. And it doesn't work like this. So let's read Matthew. I'm not going to read the whole of Matthew. Don't worry. I'm just going to go to Matthew. I think it's 12. And not Matthew 5. Sorry, not Matthew 12. It says here, uh, Matthew Chapter 5, verse 10, it says here, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you want the kingdom of heaven? And what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is everything God has. He says, I'm going to give it to you. And he says, you are blessed if you're persecuted. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then he says, yeah, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How come we don't put that on the wall or the fridge? How come that scripture isn't included in the promise box? <laughs> and say, oh, I'm claiming my persecution today. And he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. All right. So on that note, we're going to pray. And I'm going to pray for anybody that is uh, battling with sickness or disease. If any one of you, anyone here, wherever you are, needs prayer, I can pray for you. I can pray for you. Let's pray. Let's pray for the, for the, for the sick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So just put down what, what, what your prayer requests. Hallelujah. Okay. I'm just going to see if there's anyone here. All right. So if you've got anything, you can just write it down. Huh? You you on prayer, at least. Yes. What, 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 for what? Um, you spoke about giving up all pharmacia. Mm, yeah, yeah. Jeez, yeah. That's the, the last pharmacia that I've given is really, really giving up. Now I don't know how to leave it. Because... If you just leave blood pressure medication. No, no, no. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, okay. So, because they can't hear you. So, Elise is saying, how does she get delivered from her, her medication? The only one way to get delivered from your medication, first of all, you got to renounce it. And then you got to ask God and you got to trust God to heal you. So, you don't need it. Yeah. You don't get healed by stopping medication. You get healed by faith. Yeah. Okay. So, there's nothing, you know, if you've been on it, I'm not, you're not supposed to go and just stop it. You're supposed to get healed. And when you're healed and you take medication, you'll have a really bad effect. And then you can go to your medical professional and, and get it verified with them. So, but what, what the message was last time when we were talking about that is to get delivered from that thing. Yeah. All right, we need to renounce it, which you did. Yes. But that's the first part. The second part is 
you got to believe that you're healed. And when you're healed, you won't need it because your blood pressure will be fine. Okay, if you take blood pressure tablets and your blood pressure is fine, there's going to be a problem. Okay, if your blood pressure is not well and you just stop taking, there can be a major problem. So the answer here is a miracle. Not, oh, I'm going to get healed when I stop taking medication. No, no. No, you don't get healed by stopping taking medication. Unless, of course, you're, well, you're healthy. You've got to say, Lord, heal me. And then suddenly you don't need it anymore. It's like, you know, you don't need a headache pull if your headache's gone. Just get rid of the headache. You got it? Okay. So ultimately to get delivered from all the, the medication is we need to be divine health. See, when you are healthy, you don't need one pull. No. You got it? I got a testimony of my wife. Yes. Who was suffering a long time ago with bad blood pressure. Bad blood pressure, yeah. Very bad. If she doesn't take a pull. Yeah. Okay, do you want to just... One day she came, the okay. kid took the... You want to just uh, share, yeah. Just such a... Because they can't hear you. Okay. Because so, the people, the, it's been recorded. Just put it there. Oh. Yeah, okay. Apostle Kish just wants to share this of your, your wife with the blood pressure. Yeah, yeah uh, my wife, uh, name is Fina. A long time ago, uh, around about 2010, uh, 11, 12, uh, 13, 14, uh, she was suffering, battling a lot uh, with the blood pressure. Yeah. And it was very bad. Very bad. She went to the second or third level, something like that. Uh, we're taking her to the hospital. They, they, she has to take like two uh a day something like that or oh, the, the the percentage was too high okay and it was very bad sure. so without that it was worse okay she have all the time constantly taking that pills okay. so that she can live but it came to pass one day um we went to church and well, now we're back we got to the house uh where she put all the pills uh the kids by mistake we don't know by angel mistake they went to collect all the pills and they ran in that time, the children were like um, seven, five, seven years old. Mm. They took the pills of their mother. They went to the toilet. They threw it. They opened it. They threw all the pills and they flushed them. They just did this. They flushed themselves. everything. They flushed the pill. And they left only the, 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 the container inside the water in the toilet. So the mother was like, now tonight I have to get something. Otherwise, I won't survive. I'm going to die. Because the doctor see your level. If you try me, up, you're dead. Yeah, yeah. Because she's been that with that like about more than two years okay, with the yeah, yeah. pills. Then uh, we have to buy it. All the farmers in the box back, they knew us. When I come, they don't ask me anything. Oh, you want to be a CEO for my wife? So they gave me, I paid. Yeah, so then it came to pass. She's looking for the pills that she can find and everything. And the kids are laughing. The kids are playing. And uh, oh. we didn't have money to go buy. It was late. And she kept quiet. And the Lord said, the Holy Spirit said to her, it's done. It's done. She said, maybe, can you imagine the children, they threw all the pills. Maybe we're going to need another letter from the doctor yeah, to yeah. go back into the night. Yeah, yeah. What's going to happen tomorrow? Then uh, after that, uh, she didn't take the pills at night. And tomorrow morning, she didn't take it. I just went to church and uh, I, I forgot about going by for her. And I said to myself, okay. And it came to pass after third day, she said to me, don't forget to get in the pills. I said, okay. And I'm keeping forgetting, uh, <laughs> buying her to go to the pharmacy. And since that day, oh, until boy. today, it's like more than seven years, she was healed because she said, she sit in bed, she said, Lord, I thank you for healing me. I won't go back. Because she said to me, since the kids, they throw that pills in that and the Lord said to her, it's done. You never ever take. And she believed that she was healed. Okay. She believed that she would never ever take that. Thing. And it was a risky. I was shaking. She made a, a decision. Yeah, it's laughing. My yeah. husband, I won't take this thing anymore. And I believe God healed me. And I was shaking. What's going to happen? And she collapsed in front of me. She said, I'm done. I'm healed. I'm sorted. Until today, she never ever go back to the pulse. Sure. I thank God for that. And it's so scary things I'm talking about. Yeah, no, about. no. And she believed that, and I know I can lose her any time, but now I never lose her. She believed and she's healed. Okay, well, that, that is a major testimony. See, the thing here with that testimony is that that was by revelation that she had, not by revelation you had. Mm. In other words, she had revelation. Yeah. And she did that on her own. Yeah. 
All right. And so we don't suggest anyone do that unless God spoke to you. Yes. Otherwise, mm. you get faith foolishness and presumption, and then suddenly you have a major problem because you're stepping out on some what somebody else did. Yeah. But God spoke to her. Yes. And then she had the miracle. Because he said, I healed you. That mm. was it. That's supernatural. Hallelujah. No, that's a matter. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. So there we go. Based on that, I'm going to pray for everyone right now to heal you of the blood pressure. Then you don't need the pulse and the, and the children can flush them. <laughs> or he can flush them. Okay. So we're going to pray for blood. You've got blood pressure. All right. I want to say, the, the private volunteer that I have is that so she can go to her doctor without seeing the doctor. One of the ladies will take her blood pressure. Yes. The blood pressure was yeah. yeah. And so she had to tell the doctor. Yeah, she had to tell, yeah. So the doctor tried to uh, so All right, so I'm just gonna explain it because people can't hear you. Um, we got we got people listening in. And, and they can't hear you. Well, you need to, otherwise you can't talk. Uh, because Howard's talking, but you can't hear him. Okay. So yeah, just 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 make it short. We are praying. Yeah. So her uh, blood pressure came down, and we went to the ladies again. It had improved, yes, but it was still very high. Yes, yes. Instead of over two hundred, it was hundred and sixty over hundred. That's still very high. Yes. So we carried on praying, and they said they've got to talk to the doctor again. So the doctor says these pills. Right. She's still not feeling right, but we're praying. And eventually she went back a couple of days later. It was still high, but it wasn't normal. Okay. So they said, come back in two hours. So we continued praying, and the doctor took the blood pressure. Yes. It was still high, but not normal. And then he took another one immediately, and it was down to normal. So he was quite happy. And he said she was healed. Okay, so here's the thing. Yeah, let me tell you what happens here. Okay, I have to tell. Let me tell you what happens to you. Okay, that you you've been healed most probably multiple times. At least you have been healed, and every time the devil comes back with lying symptoms, you receive the sickness back over and over. Somebody, you you lose your healing because you believe the symptoms over the word. So when the lying symptoms come back to you, you got to rebuke and say, "I was healed on that and that day," because even the doctor said you don't need it. Your 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 blood pressure is perfect. No, you said I must carry on with the blood pressure, even though it's wonderful. No, but, no, the pulse. But that does, it means nothing. The pulse do not get you unhealed. What gets you unhealed is unbelief. The moment you believe you're sick, you're sick. The moment you believe those symptoms. So, in other words, you carry on and you start to feel the blood pressure, because you can feel the blood pressure when it's up and down, right? That's when you're supposed to rebuke it. Rebuke it because it's a demon. It's a demon of infirmity. The problem is we tolerate the enemy because he gives us unbelief. And he says, you, you know what? You're not healed anymore. So guess what? God heals you. The devil comes to steal your healing. Like God blesses you financially. Then he comes to steal the finances and say, no, you can't steal it. You can't steal my healing. You can't steal the finances. So here's the problem. We allow the devil to steal what God already gave to us. That's just the lesson here. Because your testimony is saying, that at least was healed. Now, who took the healing away? It wasn't God. God didn't change his mind and say, you know what? I think you need about suffering. God never gave you the sickness in the first place. He heals you, right? You were healed. The doctor even confirmed you healed. I'm not worried that he said carry on taking, because that's just a safe strategy for the doctor, because he doesn't know what's happened. Maybe he just thought it was okay for the afternoon. Yeah. So he says, okay, well, carry on with the pulse. He's not going to say. But if you had to keep coming back and it was a perfect over a few weeks or months, he'll eventually take you off. The pulse, right? You'll say, okay, well, it's a miracle yet. Because no, no, you don't no no no. Don't hope. Don't hope. You gotta don't hope so. No, hope so. Let's not hope so. Let's just believe that you are healed and you won't need because if you keep taking medication when you are healed, it's not gonna be good for you. All right. So he he will take you off. 
all right, when you are having confirmation that you heal because the blood... Yeah, well, you go, you keep going back and you say, and you'll say, actually, your blood pressure is fine over a few weeks or months or whatever. Anyway, what I'm saying is, the devil comes back and he gives you the symptoms of blood pressure, which you feel dizzy or you feel whatever, you feel weak. And then he says, you see, you're not healed. That's where he steals. That's where he steals from. That's where he steals from all of us. You've got the healing. It's like your wife was healed. They say for three weeks. Three months, suddenly her blood pressure goes down. She says, you know what? I better get the pulse again. Like that, stolen. Did God heal her or not? If she stands on that, she will never go back on that, that healing. But many people lose their healing because the devil comes to steal. And all he has to do is convince you that you're not healed. Stand your ground. You do, stand your ground, 100%. You've got to fight to maintain the victory. You got to fight to get it and you got to fight to maintain it. That's why he says, having done all, Amen. stand. So we got to learn to stand. So after you have the testimony, you must say, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. He's going to come back with the lying symptoms. Howard, get ready. When you have a miracle, after the miracle, there's your test. Test number two. Will you keep the miracle? Because if you don't keep the miracle, what's the point of getting the miracle in the first place? Now you get discouraged. Up and down. Yo, yo. Yeah. Miracle today, miracle gone tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's it's disheartening and discouraging and whatever. And eventually you can say, oh, well, God doesn't love you, no, because you know, he keeps giving this thing and taking away. And meanwhile, God had nothing to do with taking away. You know what I mean? God never took it away. He gave it to you. In fact, you were healed before you were born. He says, By your stripes. He says, By my stripes, you were healed. You are healed whether you feel like it or not. You healed whether the doctor believes it or not. You healed whether you're taking medication or not. Your healing has got nothing to do with the facts of your symptoms. Okay. All right. Now let's pray. Okay. Um, all right. So let's take authority. And, and, and remember how the devil steals, Elise. Do you know what the demon is that steals from you? It's a demon of unbelief, but the unbelief comes in the form of different lies. And he has a lie. I'll tell you a lie. Fear. Fear is what the enemy is attacking. Fear of dying. Fear of getting sick. Fear of what? Fear, fear, fear. Fear. There's a thousand one different fears. So we're going to repent. We're going to repent for fear. And we're going to cast out fear. Perfect love. That's why we're focusing on love. Cast out fear. Because if you've got fear of sickness, guaranteed you're going to get that sickness. Because whatever you fear will come upon you. If you're, free, if you're afraid of being sick, you're going to get sick. It's like saying, put an advert outside your house, say, demons, I'm looking for sickness. <laughs> you put fear up, they come like a blood, attracts a shark. You know the dog can smell fear on you. Do you know demons can smell it? They can see it a mile away. The moment you're afraid, they're on you. More afraid of the thought than I fear of sickness because since I've taken the pills. Oh, okay. Side effects. Yes. Every night I get my whole body burns. Look, there's another thing. When you take pills, they're always side effects. They give you a list this long about side effects. So you know what I'd do? I'd go back to the I'd go back to the doctor and say, a doctor, I want to actually take, I want to go off these pills. I think when last time you took on no, 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 no. Say, I want to get off these pills. Just tell him, I want to get off these pulls. Make a plan. Yeah. You cut it. Oh, yours are cutting. So, in other words, you're going to say, I want to get in. And you're trusting God for completeness. Yeah. So, let's trust the Lord to deliver you from. Because now, if you're afraid of the pulls and you take them, it's going to have more side effects. Because now that's another door opening. No, no, no. You see how the devil puts us into bondage. So, now you're afraid of the pulls. That are supposed to keep the symptoms, but those pills will never heal you. They never heal you, those pills. Take them for that and go off little by little. Yeah, but in other words, you've got to ask him for a program to do that. Yeah. All right, but let's not go into too technical side of, because now I'm not a, a medical practitioner here. There's more qualified people to deal with this thing. But the, 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 the main thing that the enemy is attacking you with is fear. Okay? Yeah. Fear. Right? You've just said you're afraid of the pills. Does God, is God afraid of those pills? All right. Don't be afraid of them. Just repent. 
for being afraid of them and saying, Lord, I'm not afraid of these pills and I thank you that you're going to deliver me from these pills because I won't need them. You understand? You don't need pills that you don't need, but if you're afraid of them, it opens another door. The devil is a tormentor. Okay. Fear. Fear is a liar. And every time you're afraid, you open the door for a demon. Every time. Every time I'm afraid, I open a door for a demon. Because fear is a sin. Fear is a sin. He says, fear not. So when you're afraid, even if you don't say anything, there's a devil can find out that you're afraid. He can see it. It's like, a, like an illuminous sign. Is it? Fear. It's a, do you know that? But just, by the way, fear is a spirit. Do you know that? Fear is a spirit. Well, the Bible says, I've not given you a spirit. This spirit. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So when you have a fear, you have a, you have a demon. Did you know that? It's not just a thought. Do you know when a demon of fear comes in, you get afraid, your hair standing up on the back of your neck. It's a demon touching you. Now that thing doesn't dwell in your spirit. It comes and dwells in your soul. And just says, hey, and it's a familiar spirit. You know why it's familiar? Because you've been having it your whole life. You're familiar with that thing. You think it's you. It's not you. It's a demon. So he's saying, don't tolerate that demon anymore. It's like a, it's like a gorilla. It wants to jump on you and strangle you. Now you must jump on it and kick it out, get, kick its head in and get, out, get it out of your life. All right. I'm talking about fear. You got it? All right, so are we ready to get delivered from fear? Mm -hmm. And the good news is perfect love. Oh, it's not, fear. Oh. It's not just a thought. Perfect love means mature love. Now we're going to go into the word perfect, but mature love is what casts out fear. The reason you have fear is because your love is not perfected. And you know you got to love your enemy. You gotta love God and you gotta love everyone. And when you love everyone, you're not gonna be afraid of anything because you're delivered from all fear. Okay. All right, you got it. Fear is the door, and fear is unbelief. And unbelief opens the door for the enemy to steal from us. He steals everything from us the same way called unbelief. And unbelief is fear. One of the unbelief, uh, one of the thing, uh, demons of unbelief is fear. Because fear is just. Fear is, 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 is believing something that's not true. The fear of whatever you've got, your fear is, is not true. The only fear that is true is the fear of God. That's the true fear. Fear of God. All right, let's, let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we just want to ask you to deliver us from every tormenting spirits, tormenting thought, tormenting uh, belief system that is, that is tormented us for many years now in jesus name we want to repent for fear just repent lord we repent today for fear fear of sickness fear of uh taking these poles fear of side effects fear of pain fear of dying fear of suffering fear of loss all the fears lord i repent for it and i renounce i renounce say i renounce fear in Jesus, name. in Jesus' name, I resist fear. I rebuke fear. In Jesus' name, you leave me. And Father, I thank you that you fill me with your perfect love. I command all sickness to go. Blood pressure. My blood pressure is normal. It's normal. In Jesus' name. I do not have high and low blood pressure in Jesus' name. My blood pressure is perfect. In Jesus' name. My health is perfect. In Jesus' name. Right now. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just lift up everyone that's got in any spirit of infirmity, any soreness right now. I lift up only right now in Jesus' name. And I say your elbow is healed in Jesus' name. We command healing in your elbow right now. In Jesus' name, we say healed. 
Your body is healed. Only you healed. At least you healed. Anyone else? We just say you're healed now by the blood and the stripes of Jesus. Right now you healed. Everyone said? Amen. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. You're healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Uh, Anli, uh, you want to you want to you want to share? Hallelujah. I'm just agreeing Are and you... uh, pointing my <laughs> throwing my left hand in the end, saying, "Thank you, no more pain." I mean, Amen. Okay. All right. Amen. 